Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Dave's Faves. And today we're talking about Dvorak's Symphony No. 7, considered by many to be Dvorak's greatest symphony, although not necessarily by me. The reason it's considered to be his greatest symphony is because that's code. It's code for most like Brahms. And in the in the Germano-centered, nationalistic, kind of foolish, slant, academic, prejudicial... Let me put it to you this way. Academia, which prides itself on being open-minded, is often just the opposite. In fact, tons and tons and tons of it is sunk in outdated 19th century notions of of national supremacy and other things. And I'm not saying this to be one of those, like, you know, woke, crazy people. This is a fact. Musicology, for example, take the profession. It's essentially a German enterprise. It was a wonderful thing. It was invented by fabulous German scholars, both, most of the time to analyze German music. And so the, the value of a piece of music was determined by the extent to which it was analyzable according to the methods devised by German nationalist scholars to analyze German nationalist music, which is most of 19th century instrumental music, actually, because Germany, let's face it, they deserve credit. They invented most of it, and fabulously so. So there you go. Dvorak, in particular, as I've said 100 million, billion, trillion, zillion times, has suffered from comparison to the fact that he should have been the Czech Brahms. And his, his, the value of his work is determined by the extent to which he emulates Brahms and the pieces that don't, like the symphonic poems and the operas and the choral works and tons of other stuff that he wrote. That's all just disregarded because Brahms didn't do it. And of course, if Wagner did it, Wagner is Wagner. Nobody can emulate Wagner. And you cannot imitate Brahms and Wagner simultaneously because they hated each other. The truth is Dvorak did all of that and more. He was the most versatile composer of the entire second half of the 19th century. And in my view, greater than any of those other people, frankly. But that's my personal taste. You know, to say that one thing is greater than another thing is really, is, is stupid, really. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. That's just an opinion that you throw out there. In real life, greatness is greatness. And, you know, it's like comparing infinities in mathematics. Some infinities are larger than other infinities, but they're both infinities. We don't need to go into the details of that, but I just find it fascinating. So Dvorak Seventh is one of his greatest symphonies, to get back to the topic, of course. And my favorite recording, I mean, it's been recorded a million times and very, very well. My favorite recording, this may surprise you, is this one. Václav Neumann with the Czech Philharmonic, his second digital one. The analog one is excellent, too. It's very, very good. But I like this digital one even more because it's a little bit leaner. I think, and a little bit more ferocious. But here's the thing. Dvorak VII lives or dies by the extent to which conductors try to make it sound like Brahms. It shouldn't. It should sound like Dvorak. Yes, it has a certain amount of, of you, you might call, Germanic developmental savoir-faire in it. Of course, all Dvorak symphonies do. This one may be more than most. It's superbly worked out work. It really is. It's, but it's full of gorgeous, gorgeous, typically dvorak tunes. And it really is a tough little piece to do. It's tricky. It's tricky because the orchestration is very sober. Even for Dvorak, Dvorak's usually very colorful. Here, he's trying deliberately to rein himself in a little bit and focus on process, developmental process. And that, you might also say, is a Brahmsian characteristic. It's true. But, you know, the interesting thing about the seventh is that Dvorak wrote it supposedly as an answer to Brahms' third, which Dvorak thought was fabulous. He said he had to write a symphony that must shake the world. I love a little ambition. But actually, the Brahms' third was heavily indebted to Dvorak's fifth. So, you, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Not only that, but both Brahms and Dvorak, when Dvorak was working on the seventh, Brahms was working on his fourth. And what's very interesting is like both symphonies for the first time 
in the composer's work omit exposition repeats. They have certain things in common with each other, although they couldn't really have known each other's work that well. I don't know exactly what the detail is, and we don't know the details of all of the composer's back and forth or communications. So it's impossible to tell who influenced who or what influenced what. They were both working on parallel tracks in revivifying the classical tradition of symphonic composition after Beethoven. So, and it was certainly within the capacity of, of Dvorak as a genius and Brahms as a genius to just do similar things. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment in musical history. And I actually think a comparison of like Dvorak's seventh with the Brahms fourth, not the third, would be a wonderful, wonderful sort of disc pairing or even concert, you know, to, to see both of them. Putting either one of them first on the program on different days, I would emphasize. But the reason I think this performance is so lovely is because, first of all, it's unbelievably exciting and well played. It's the Czech Philharmonic, which is always wonderful, the climax of the first movement. Neumann nails it like virtually nobody. It's wonderful. And he really does the end of the finale well. The finale is tricky. It's tricky because, you know, it has a succession of codas. It keeps trying to end and then it doesn't find its way, then it tries again, and then it doesn't find its way, and then it tries again, and finally the huge chorale comes in and bang, or at the end. And most performers tinker a little bit with the orchestration at the very end, because Dvorak's you know, orchestration leading into that chorale was only for strings, and most people add horns or sometimes trumpets, so that it goes, yeah, da, yeah, bum, bum, for that big chorale. And it sounds wonderful when you do. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of fiddling here and there for the sake of the point. And I really, I really just think this is one of Neumann's best performances, a work he really, really understood well. And the other thing that I like about this is that, you know, Neumann gets dumped on because he wasn't Anshurl. Lee, when you, when you take over from a great, great musician, you're always at a disadvantage. Neumann may not have been as great a musician as Anshul, but then again, we run into the problem of comparing greatnesses again, don't we? Which is, again, you know, a waste of time. It was sort of like what happened when Barbaroli took over the New York Philharmonic from Toscanini. It was, it was doomed. Nobody was going to give the guy time of day. And the same thing happened in the West anyway, in the reviews I always read. Um, with reviews of Neumann's performances. But you know, some of them were great and some of them weren't. And you have to hear them whole and you have to judge accordingly. And this seventh is great, period, at least for me. And that's why it is my favorite Dvorak seventh on Superfun. And I, I just think it's glorious. And you know, now the Dvorak symphonies in the box are the mono, uh, not the mono, they're the earlier stereo cycle. They're not these digital ones. So this one may be harder to find. The digital cycle is still available separately, I think, in a series of two twofers, each with three symphonies. And this will be in the box with seven, eight, nine, and they're all very good. So you don't have to worry about that if that's the only way you can get it. But it's a stunning performance of a very, very great symphony, which I simply adore. So keep on listening, my friends. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.